What's up guys, welcome back to another Marvel cast. Today we have a special guest, Yasha Khan. Yasha is a national level weightlifter, a weightlifting coach, and he's hung around with some of the strongest athletes in the game. Klokov, Ilya, Vasily, Tatiana, and he's toured with powerlifting coach Poroshenko. Come on to discuss a little bit of anti-doping and a little bit about his weightlifting career. We hope you enjoy this episode, so let's check it out. All right, Yasha, what's going on, man? How the hell you been? Thank you for coming on. Happy to be here. I've been good. What about you? How are you? Oh, man, everything's going swimmingly. Um, have you been with uh, all this COVID stuff? Have you been holding up? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. So in New York, uh, Brooklyn died for most of the last year. And it's it's been... Um, the reasons why I'm in New York have kind of gone away at least for this year, but people are starting to come back. Everything's opening up. Things are getting better. Um, I've been good myself. Are you still in New York, or did you move out for a while? I live in New York, but right now I'm in Boston. Yeah, you're at um, what, your research lab? Mm -hmm. A cannabis lab in Framingham, Massachusetts, and another one in Pennsylvania. Nice. And All for right. the, the whole time, um, I've taken advantage of COVID in the best way possible. I traveled a good amount to places that otherwise are completely packed, but during COVID they were empty and cheap and excellent. Where'd you travel? Um, Kenya and Egypt and hopefully going somewhere in the next couple weeks. What, what made you go to Kenya and Egypt? So like it, it, it met all the check marks that it needed to meet. I haven't been there um, with COVID, I was allowed to go. It was warm enough when I went. <laughs> um, it was kind of kind of the perfect time to go because those places are usually big tourist traps. And during COVID, they were completely empty. And you know, so so long as I'm careful and I do everything right, um, there were no health concerns to me or anyone around. Everything was much cheaper than usual and completely empty. So. You get to see all the sights without a ton of people all around. Yep. It's pretty awesome. Yep, yep. Yeah. So you're um, or you're still doing weightlifting coaching? Yeah, kind of. So I you am. were doing uh, so a lot of coaching and you were doing a lot of uh, uh, lifting. Tell us a little bit about your background in weightlifting, how you got started, where you were lifting, and anything else you want to throw out there. Sure. I was a wrestler at some point, and then I was at a local gym working out for wrestling. Uh, some older gentleman that doesn't speak a word of English came up to me in Russian and said, I want to coach you in weightlifting. I didn't know that weightlifting was a sport, but out of respect to an older guy, I was like, sure, let's, let's do this. Within a couple months, I was just in love with the sport and the idea of next week I could, could get better. It's so easy to measure... Um, getting better and so Lev Epstein was my coach for many years um, excellent relationship there and just kept growing in the sport making friends growing my my community that was the start what were your best numbers in competition and what was your best competition um, best snatch was 156 best clean and jerk I think 182 181 one of those best competition uh, probably one of the nationals where I medaled it wasn't I don't know if that, those were my highest total numbers but meddling at nationals was the best result is that 2011 I think 2010 2011 and 2012 all of them got third place and lifted enough to get the medal so however much that was Nice. Th those were good competitions. Yep. The early days of weightlifting. Well, earlier days than now, I guess. <laughs> yep. <laughs> when there was like 50 people signed up for USA Weightlifting, now there's thousands. Yep. yep, yep. So what was it like, first of all, what's it like cleaning 182? Because that sounds like uh, something I really want to do one day, but I probably won't. <laughs> I mean, the first time you lift any weight, it's exciting. <laughs> and you have like the, the anxiety 
and the uh, like rage that you build up right before doing it. Um, and with a successful lift, like it usually feels easy. So n not bad at all. Yeah, it's, it's such a fun time when things go right and the stars align and you hit this milestone PR and it's just like, it means a lot to you, but then you show other people who don't know anything about weightlifting and they're like, all right, that's cool. Uh, yeah, irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> irrelevant, yeah, cares. nobody cares. Yeah. Um, so now the sport of weightlifting has grown and you've done, you've basically became the liaison for the Russian Federation tour, essentially working with Klokov, Tatiana, Ilya, Vasily, um, I, I don't know, I'm probably missing a few names there, but you, how did you get involved with those guys and how much of it was just you being able to speak Russian and able to take them over or them just finding you somehow? Right place, right time. Yeah. Kind of thing where I was an American weightlifter who spoke Russian, understood the culture, understood like what are the questions and anxieties that everyone has, how do people view Russian weightlifting at the time. Um, and I made friends, just so happened, with a few folks that were on the Russian national team, Vasily Kolovnikov and Nikita Zernev. And uh, we did a few seminars locally, and they went well. And then uh, one of them asked, could we do something bigger? Could we earn more money? Could we do something national? Could we do something more? And I was like, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know if we can do it without like big name recognition. And so Vicedia said, name anyone, and I'll get them. And so I was just, you know, the, the people that were following at the time, the big names, I, was, I like called out like two or three names. And the next day he was like, okay, yeah, they're in. And that was, I think, Ilya and Klokov. And I was like, are you, what, what do you mean? And he was like, yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll join. And then I had to figure out like, okay, what does this actually mean? What do I plan? Um, how do I get this thing going? And that, that was the start of it. What was the first stop? Waxman's gym. Was that when uh, you Angeles. and Ilya had a snatch off? No. No, that, that was, was that one? maybe a month later. No, so that, that tour was a month long or so, where okay. we traveled all around the country. At first, it was Donnie Venturosa, a friend and coach, um, Nikita Dornyev, and Vasily. We went there to do like maybe a two or three day seminar, started to kick things off. And then from there, we flew over to Hawaii where we met Klokov in the airport. Just a surreal, a person that I've seen on YouTube and admired for a long time, shows up at the airport and we're just like, hey, we're going to do this thing. Let's go to the hotel and get things going. And he, his English wasn't that good back then, or any of their English was... So you basically kind of like translated and take them around, right? Yep. Yep. So like every before every seminar, we would get together and kind of go over how do we want this to go, what are we going to go over at what time, who's going to do what. Um, we went over all the questions that I believed could be asked, and I wanted to put those guys in front as much as possible, but if they don't feel comfortable speaking English, then at least put them in front of everyone with me translating. What was the biggest points that you tried to get across during the seminars? Well, like, what would be the difference between Russian weightlifting system versus American weightlifting system that you were trying to, like, navigate through? So, first off, this was, like, 10 years ago. Or eight yeah, years I know. Ago, it's so been I'll, a while. I'll try to remember. <laughs> we got to watch the YouTube so videos. <laughs> the, I, I, there was a lot, but I guess the central theme was that in Russia, there's a system. And with a system, every coach, in order for you to, have, to be a coach, you have to go through the same education and have the same understanding of how do you document training, how do you calculate it, how do you program, what is technique. All the terms are defined in the same way, so when two coaches are discussing something, they have the same understanding of the same terms. In the U.S., that's different. In the U.S., anyone can say that they're a coach and could be a great coach, but likely if, they, if two people from two gyms that are down the street meet, they may see weightlifting in a very different way. Right? Right. Like, w what programming to use, how often should someone power snatch, whatever else it is. 
And so we came with, look, these guys have the experience, and we're going to show you uh, how they got there and what they do for their technique and how they recommend to implement what they've learned over their years from the Russian system on the individuals in the room. So we kind of started with understanding that some folks at the seminars were going to be novices and some very experienced, but we asked everyone to view what we're saying as though they're novices, as though this is new so that we can craft it from the beginning and not try to... Um, just adjust what they currently do. Well, okay, let's restart, let's define these terms, and this is how we accomplish whatever the goal is that we set out in weightlifting, which is to lift more weight. Right. Essentially, at the end Does of the weekend... Sense? Huh? I'm sorry. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. So essentially, at the end of the weekend, uh, the, the goal was to just help people understand that you're, you're trying to lift as much weight as possible, but in a two-day... It was mostly a two-day seminar, right? Or did you guys do one? Um, I think it was mostly one-day seminars. One day. So Maybe two. I don't remember. Realistically, in a one-day seminar, you're just trying to find little nuggets of knowledge throughout these things because there's not much you can really ab absorb. You can't absorb it all in a five-hour session. So yep. a big part of this was you guys were doing the first tours of weightlifting seminars, which was awesome, and everybody knew who Klokov and Ilya were. Um, so watching them lift was just a big attraction. And that, that was just a lot of fun. I watched some of it on the YouTube videos, and I brought up that snatch liftoff that you had with Ilya, where I think you came up on top, but I'm not sure if he let you win or not. Oh, I'm sure he let me win. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I still got the prize, but I'm sure you let me win. Yeah. Uh, so back to the thing you said earlier. So um, we wanted to figure out, like, what are the nuggets that we can leave behind that would be most impactful? Because someone goes to a seminar, they pay a lot of money, they spend their Sunday or Saturday, and if they just had a good time, that's great. But if there's one piece of knowledge uh, that they can walk away with because of which it, it changes their training and their end result at the end of their career substantially, uh, then it would be we can make it worth it. So we try to identify what are those like little nuggets that we can say that people will remember and it'll be useful to them. And so I thought that that would be an easy exercise for us to do. We'll just write down 10 things that we all believe and then pitch those things. But what turned out was, let's say, Klokov would say, we should teach this. And then Ilya and Vasily would be like, we don't agree with this. And so there was a lot of debate going on about the fundamentals of like what do we all believe to be true. Because if any of us say it, then we're kind of representing the whole group as right. we say it. And right. if someone doesn't agree, then that, that's not right. So then we and then did come to a good number of things that everyone agrees on. And no one ahead of time knew what, what those are going to be. And so those are the things that we ended up uh, kind of saying that these are definitely, th these are the concrete things that we're going to, that everyone needs to understand. And then we also talked about the nuances, but did preface it by saying, for Ilya, it works this way. For Klokov, it works this way. For me, it's a little different. What was one thing that everybody disagreed on, if you remember? Um, how high on the leg the clean should make impact. Okay. And I think I remember you talking to me about this when we were, I was training with you for that one week. <laughs> where you wanted it like right above the knee. Is that a Klokov thing or an Ilya thing? That's more of a Klokov thing. Okay. That, well, that's an everyone thing where th if you hit a little bit low, then it's fine. If you hit too high, then you're turning off the traps and the traps aren't going to work the way that you need to. So by just hitting a little bit lower, you get all the right muscles working, and then it'll creep up to where it's supposed to be after enough reps. Right. Okay. So you're, you're, so for anybody who doesn't understand what we're talking about, so with, there was a clean pull, and when I did some lifting with Yasha, I was cleaning high like everybody does in weightlifting, essentially. And his point was right above the knee is where you sort of start. Is that correct? Am I correct in saying that? So right above the knee is that kind contact kind of point. Correct, yeah. 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 But if you were trying to get it to your hip to make contact 
and I would tell you it needs to be right next to the knee, where you would likely end up is somewhere halfway between, right. and that's where you should be hitting. So by trying to aim for right above the knee, you got it to where it actually should be, which is like in the middle or right below the middle of the right of the thing. So essentially, we're trying to over exaggerate the point of contact so that you hit it in the right spot. <laughs> yep. Yep. How long did you guys to do tours, and are you still in contact with those guys? Uh, so that first one was like a month, maybe a month and a week. Um, we were so drained at the end. Like, we wanted to keep going, and like we, th we said, like, okay, two months from now, we're going to do this again. And all of us were just so drained from that one that we had to take a longer break. Um, I, I did maybe like four or five tours since then with other groups. Um, I don't anymore. I do seminars sometimes, but it just hasn't been a part of my life a as it was back then for years. Right. What was, um, what would you say is one of the biggest takeaways you had personally from working with those guys? Uh, who are these folks? Idols from YouTube? You know, like when you see people that, when you see people in um, edited videos and you see them as like the heroes on podiums, you see them as, you know, they're pedestals to you. Right. And then when you meet them, you see that they're normal folks your age that have devoted their lives to a very specific thing. But otherwise, they're just the same as any other friends that you have. In terms of technique, a lot. In terms of training, a lot. Um, hugely in terms of cultural differences. Like, I grew up around either uh, immigrants in America or other Americans and have had little contact with folks that are um, patriots of other countries. That okay. was interesting to, to witness. So other than those guys, you did tour with uh, Shaco for a little while mm -hmm. and Tatiana. Yep. Yep. And uh, what, was your, what was your biggest takeaway from Boris Shaco? Because I know you were asking around a lot of powerlifters, different ideas. And what did you come up with and what did you take away from learning anything from him? For anybody who doesn't know, Boris Shaco is a powerlifting coach. And he's one of the, he has his own system, essentially, powerlifting. And he does weightlifting too, right? I think he started, or I, I know that he started as a national weightlifting coach in Kazakhstan for the youth. And spent all his life in coaching the strength sports. And then when he became the national powerlifting coach in Russia, I think he was undefeated for 10 years. His team created a lot of world champions has a good resume. Um, so before touring with him, I didn't have much experience in powerlifting. So I went to a local gym and asked uh, to be taught powerlifting just so I understand more about it. Like, w w what are people going to be asking? What are people concerned about? What do they want to know? And then when Shea Ko came, um, he was able to break down the lifts, which from the outside to me in power in power lifting, seem very simple. Like compared to the snatch, the bench press is very simple. Right. But if I was to do it myself, I was doing it very incorrectly according to him. And when he demonstrated why it's incorrect, showed the position of different muscles, you know, depending on the arch, depending on how legs are working, I, I thought there's much more, I guess, behind the scenes or under the skin that that's happening that I just wasn't aware of. And with powerlifting, because there still is much less technique than weightlifting, it's in a way easier to assess how programs work. So he did a lot of work in program development to see like how much, how, how with someone that's fully devoted to powerlifting, could we get them as strong as possible in the shortest amount of time? How can we get them to do more volume in one day or in one week in one, in one month? And he was able to experiment on a lot of people since he was in charge of national powerlifting programs. And then once he was finished, 
not finished, but w once he established a system that showed that it worked, he took that system and applied it to weightlifting. And I saw, you know, that this is one of the most decorated coaches in powerliftings uh, who understand who understands weightlifting. Their approach to strength gain um, and the pro I think the programming approach was really mind uh, eye opening for me. And as um, an American weightlifter brought in through the weightlifting system here, what are the biggest differences that you saw between an American system versus a Russian system? Would it be more volume and technique drills with the Russian system or heavier? So basically, Russia has a system where every, everything is kind of more or less starts to be controlled by, you know, the, the coaches that got the same education that meet with each other to explain how they got their athletes to be where they are. In America, we have a disjointed system where many, many different coaches experiment. They try Bulgarian and Russian and Chinese and their own systems. Uh, so th there's just no one system in America, yeah, which I think is an excellent approach. With not having a system. Yeah, because this way, if we have, if I think we had more money in the sport, America would dominate the sport because there's the freedom to try different things and fail sometimes through failure understand what doesn't work succeed sometimes and then build on that by many different coaches saying okay I'll take the thing that I saw works here and I'll try it you know in my own way a little bit differently to develop a system that would take much longer to develop in like a Russian national system well as as an American weightlifter I think we're at a severe disadvantage because most of our athletes now are so far behind, whereas in other countries, their system's put in place and they have athlete selection at a very young age. Our athlete selection process probably starts when people are 20 years old and they just found out weightlifting was a sport. So them hopping into it, we just put basically, I mean, even my philosophy as a coach, I'm going to beat the shit out of you until you lift more weight in some capacity in, in a controlled way but I don't have the time to work with you when you're 13 years old because you're not 13, you're 27 and you have a job. So as much as I can yep. get done in an hour or an hour and a half is what we're going to do. And we're going to put on as much weight as we can today. And tomorrow we'll try again. Does that kind of make sense between difference between some American systems and some? Yeah. Yeah. Partially. I mean, th there's a, in Russia, there's an incentive in China. There's an incentive. There's like, parents that want to send their kids into weightlifting because there's the possibility of getting out of your shithole village. Um, if you're good, there's a possibility of, you know, having stardom, getting a stipend, living a good life if you become a champion. In America, if you become an Olympic champion, I think you get $20,000 that will be taxed <laughs> as a prize. And so the incentive is just not, not that high. If colleges start to provide scholarships for weightlifting, then I think many more parents are going to do the same thing as, you know, they hover over the, their kids for their whole childhood and wrestling and hockey and whatever other sport does provide scholarships. That, that could be the right incentive. But, yeah, you're right. There, there's no... Kids don't start young enough in America, and it is a huge disadvantage. There's a stigma that goes along with weightlifting with uh, allowing youths and young children to lift weights at all. So trying to start a program, even as an, a business owner for kids, for weightlifting, I have to convince the parents that it's okay for them to at least attempt. Because, you know, kids need to learn. They, if you go play football, it's just as dangerous as if they lifted a weight improperly. You get hit in the head or lifted a weight improperly. It's the same damage. Yep. So it's a, it's a big problem, I think, is the, the education of our adults here are a little bit misguided on the, the approach. So how do we, yep. as a country, one, um, alleviate that pressure on the kids and then create a stipend program or an incentive for kids to excel at this sport? Because right now weightlifting is under a lot of fire with the Olympics, uh, the Olympic Committee and the IWF, as they always are, because what else would happen? And then how do we develop these programs as a country instead of as individual business owners? Like, that's a big problem. No idea. 
Yeah, I yeah. No, I agree. I, I think really, uh, if colleges start to offer scholarships, then a lot of parents are going to push their kids into this opportunity, especially at first, the first generation of it. Um, and in terms of parents being scared, yeah, there needs to be a general re-education. There needs to be some funding going into marketing from USAW. Their marketing is probably atrocious. They have these programs that the individual clubs can offer, but there's no real education on it except we need to push clean sport, clean sport, clean sport, clean sport. And other countries, out, first of all, the American uh, anti-doping is so strict compared to the rest of the world. Whereas in other countries, their system is designed around a doping program and they cycle off according to tests that they're probably going to take, which is closer to competitions. They more or less, in, uh, from what I've read, don't test as much out of competition. So how do we compete against that? If we're basically going playing uh, baseball with wiffle ball bats. So we, we could cry foul, as we do, and say, everyone's cheating, you guys have to stop it. <laughs> That's pretty much what's going on that, right now. That seems to never have worked, and thinking that it will work in the future is, I don't know, I don't think things are going to change. Uh, people will get popped, but that doesn't put the U.S. higher in the standings, other than a few lifters here and there sometimes. I don't know, I, I think changing rules is a better idea. You know, uh, anti-doping rules were set many, you know, multiple generations ago. And technology and science have changed. Why can't we at least bring up the discussion of like, why abstinence only? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, so all, the, all these other countries, and we, we cry and say how all of these athletes are drug addicts. They've been doping for their entire career. But the reality is they started weightlifting in a system where the coaches told them if you don't take these drugs, you're not going to go anywhere and you're going to be stuck in this place forever. So there's a little bit of uh, mind manipulation there, I'm sure. But what are the kids supposed Wait, to do? Why is, that, why is that manipulation? I mean, is that not the truth? What they're well, saying? that's fine, but they basically get in their heads that say, listen, you're never going to amount to anything if you don't do this. Is that not a manipulative tool? Not no, saying I, mean, I, I don't agree with it. It's probably true, yeah. but just the way you go about it could be a little bit iffy, if, it, if that's a word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so any communications, I guess, a little bit of manipulation. I'm trying to get my thoughts across to you, right? Right. And if the coach, who is respected by the kids, says, um, I'm willing to take on someone that is going to go 100% in and follow my instructions, and if you're not that person, then I'm not going to coach you, then it's understandable that the coach gets paid if the athletes perform better, is going to take the athletes that will listen to everything that the coach says, right? and then the coach believes that that's the way for them to win to do better for Which the coaches to get paid for the athletes to get paid yeah the coach isn't wrong he's not wrong yeah so if that's the way it goes and we're over here saying yes we don't take anything we're pure even though i mean in my mind i don't think we're as pure as we like everybody to believe but that's fine um how how do we, like what are we doing here we're trying to compete against these people and say all of them are drug addicts and then we pop a few of them but then you see other people pop up and they're even bigger and even stronger so the anti-doping clearly doesn't isn't effective with all this stuff that came out with the uh mclaren report and everybody who uh everybody we all looked up to Ilya as a as a you know the the best in the in the game and he comes up as a drug as doping well yeah, but everybody's doping. So have you been in contact with him about that situation and what actually happened? I have been in touch. What do you mean specifically? Well, those happened? tests were kind of are kind of iffy. They were kind of yeah. it was kind of a weird test. 
So was it just something that they had to make a, an example out of certain people with that test? Or was it they came across this test and they thought it worked really well and it showed up all of these things, even though the things that pop up in, within that test aren't exactly measurable? Or exactly. So the system that, so, so we know that the system's corrupt, right? There's no question about that. Right. So findings in either direction, some people being caught as having dope and some people having found to be clean, we can't take that as fact. Or we can take as fact that that's the, the ruling, but not what was actually in their system. Right, because what that test found... So, so we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're talking like about a, a broken system and the, the results of it. Like, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. So as a result from the, so these tests from the uh, IWF or the IOC, they went back eight years and tested sample, the B samples. And according to the way the tests work, and I think it was created by the guy from Icarus, um, it would test and show up long-term metabolites of oral terenable. So if you had any amount in your system, they basically banned the shit out of you. You were done. And what happened was all those tests came back positive, so they just sanctioned yep. everybody. But the reality of it is that that test doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove when you took it, if you took it recently, or if you took it just in your life ever. So it's a very controversial s subject, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So these guys you work with, basically their career is essentially over as, in, as far as weightlifting goes. Yep, yep. And, and I've, I've known some lifters who were popped who said that like, they were told they were popped before being tested as kind of just part of that corruption. So it's, it's a system that some people learn how to make money from it and some people were able to buy places and competitions with it. And so it's just a broken system. I think everyone agrees that it's broken. Yeah. And like, if we continue to work within a broken system, we're never going to get the results that anyone wants. Or we're not going to get the results that fair play is supposed to get. It makes you wonder how much longer these athletes and uh, these competitions that are just happening have left before they are popped as well. I mean, yep. I'm, I'm waiting and for... clean athletes... Yeah. Clean athletes are put into a terrible situation. Uh, dirty athletes are sometimes also put in a terrible situation. And just like everyone other than those people that are profiting from it are kind of... Um, their lives are decided by folks that are profiting from it. That sucks. Yeah, totally. And the athletes are stuck in the middle. They get screwed. And... The people that are passing money back and forth to buy medals, do they give that money back? No, <laughs> they just no, get rid of vacations and <laughs> they, homes. They just find another athlete. That's it. Yep. So these guys, uh, the athletes have to give their medals back, pay fines, and then are sanctioned for four years or up to eight years or life, depending on yep. which one it is. And the people who put and the thing that they worked on, yep, yeah, it's gone. And then the people that put yep. this situation together. All right, we'll just find some more people. Yep. So, what do you think we can do about that? Like, is there anything? Is there? Do you think that no, no doping is is the correct answer, or no anti-doping is the correct answer? Like, what do you think is the is a way that they can go around this, where it's beneficial for everyone? I think regulations need to adapt to the times. Anti-doping has been around for a long time. And it's kind of similar to, remember, I don't know what grade we were in, um, our drugs are bad, right? The there's nothing program. good about any, any, yeah, like there's nothing good about any drug. And then you try it once and you're like, uh, it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and everyone that's, that's smoked a little weed or tried other things, they're like, you know, m maybe abstinence only is not the right thing. I wish I actually knew the things that actually apply to life from this. Weightlifting is unhealthy, like at a high level. We're getting ourselves to the point of like the edge of overtraining constantly. 
If you go over, then you suffer. If you don't get close enough to the edge, you don't grow. And that's unsafe. And everyone that's had a long career in weightlifting, you know, they come out of it with injuries that last a lifetime. Um, if some chemical support was allowed, then people may be safer. There may be fewer long-term side effects, um, fewer injuries that last a whole lifetime. I is that terrible? I don't think so. Do you think that if they allowed certain drugs that it would make the sport entirely safer or do you think people would just still take everything they could under the sun? I don't know, but there needs to be an open discussion about these regulations. Yeah. Like, you can't... Uh, like, with speed limits, if someone goes a little bit over the speed limit, I think everyone's fine with that, right? A little bit, like a mile or two. Yeah, sure. That's fine. There's, there's excessive. Um, and so th there just needs to be an understanding instead of different people having a very different interpretation of how to work with current regulations, which state absolutely no doping of any kind. It would be good if we had an open discussion about, you know, these are the benefits, actual benefits of each of these PEDs. Uh, these are the negatives. This is what happens at different ages. And then based on that, discuss regulations moving forward. But just saying plainly, like, no, they're bad, period. Um, is going to maintain our corrupt system. I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here. So do you think it's um, more so that they can't get every country on the same page as far as doping regulations go, and every country pretty much has their own regulations of whether it's even legal in the country or not, that instead of arguing, okay, athletes can take this, but they can't take this, they just make it all off the table, and that creates an even more um, corrupt system. All off the table as in no drugs of any kind? No drugs. Well, yeah, we have a really, really corrupt system right now. Yeah. Where someone controls who fails and who passes uh, based on money coming in. Or at least partially, right? Um, so we, we have a system that definitely doesn't work. So if we start there, any change would be, you know, possibly better. But there's no discussion about can we at least openly discuss the benefits of these things? Because people start yelling drugs are bad, and how dare you say we should discuss this. What if it was like um, up until a certain point for a competition, you have to have nothing in your system? Would that be a better program as than to nothing at all ever? I think so. That'd probably be something. Because yeah. pretty much most of these athletes are taking something up until competition and they're just finding a way around the test or they're not getting tested. But yeah. it becomes more Or they're sneaky. paying to not get tested at yeah. the competition. Yep. Yeah, so now if if they had a rule where it was like you have 90 days to clean out, before you come to this competition, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that would work a little bit better. I don't know. I think people, it's, cheaters are going to cheat. It doesn't really matter what rules you put in place. Somebody's always going to break the rules and bend it. Well, I, I had 89 days of clean lifting. <laughs> How is that bad? So. No, I don't, I'm not sure about that. But because back to speed limits, if the speed limits everywhere were five miles an hour and our cars can go 80, I'm pretty sure that everyone would, a lot of people would break that. Right. But if we have regulations like we do now with speed limits, you know, sometimes it's 25, sometimes 35, sometimes 65, then most people don't exceed by, that by more, by more than 10 miles an hour. Right. And we have a safe environment, I think. For the most part. And this, yeah, yeah. And, and the speed limits, like, they change when someone says, like, they should be changed somewhere. We're allowed, we're allowed to discuss it. Yeah. Speed bumps were needed. So we need more discussion about this, guys. We need to figure out how to keep the athletes safe and how to keep the systems all unified. Because right now... Yeah, Olympics because... It, <laughs> go ahead. If someone just yells, no, we can't discuss this, or no, this can't be a part of the system, then we're stuck in the current system that everyone agrees is corrupt. Yeah. I don't have an answer for you. But no, nobody does. Yeah. That's why we're just talking about it. That's why it's fun to yeah. kind of discuss it. All right. Uh, I would personally about... like to watch. 
watch uh, sports where the folks are as healthy as they can be. Yeah. And healthy means like not abusing of anything, but if they need to use something, then you know it's, it's provided. I, I want to see the 500 kilo total. Do you think Lush More is going to snatch 227? No. You don't think so? No, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, man, he's very close, and they all look very easy. I'm sure they're not, but they yeah. all look very easy. But he's only gone up two kilos in, like, two, three years, right? Um, he got 220 a couple years ago now? Maybe that's true, yeah. He snatched two. Tw I think he snatched two twenty. What did he snatch at the two. last year? Two twenty-two, and he snatched two twenty-three in training. I don't know about that. Yeah, I think he snatched two twenty-three like uh, two weeks before. He did like two twenty-three and one sixty something. Hmm. The guy's an animal. I know a lot of countries give out like grants, monies, prizes for any world record. So some lifters, they do one kilo every competition to get that new um, reward. But if it took them multiple years to gain a few kilos, then to see a jump to five kilos like that, that'd be really cool. But I bet I would bet against it. I don't know, man. An extra three kilos on that bar, I think he's, he could, that's not the problem. <laughs> that's five kilos, though. Oh, from 222, yeah. 223 in training. Yeah, uh, he'll have a an Instagram video, I'm sure, going up soon. Two twenty seven, and then one sixty, one seventy three, two seventy three. Jesus Christ. Yeah, uh, will be cool to see. Yeah. Well, all right, brother. I'm gonna, I'll let you go. We'll, uh, you can get back to work. I appreciate you coming on here, man. Um, where can people Big find you if you want people to find you? <laughs> Um, uh, social medias, Yasha Khan, at wherever. Yeah, it's got a ton of knowledge, guys. I appreciate you, Yasha, for uh, coming on here and talking about this stuff with me. Um, any closing remarks? Uh, no, it was a pleasure. Thanks right, for man. having me. Age is inevitable. Weakness is not. So get out there and live some shit, guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching today's Marblecast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any content. Check out our Spreadshirt shop to grab some swag. And if you would like to support the Marblecast, please head over to anchor.fm. All the links are in the description, and it helps us out to keep the channel running. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time.